Hi, and welcome to today's international law discussion. I'm Major Chris Kosnitsky, a military professor here at the Stockton Center for International Law at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, today's discussion is on Afghanistan 2021, uh, specifically the international legal implications following the withdrawal of U.S. forces in the fall. Uh, and then today we're going to actually, for this panel, drill down into two areas, the first being the rule of law and the second being humanitarian assistance, but of course we'll touch on a few other areas. Uh, this discussion follows a workshop we held here at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, for the workshop, we invited approximately uh, 25 experts from across the field and academia. Uh, we had representatives from across the Department of Defense, uh, the Department of State, uh, NATO, the UN, the International Committee for the Red Cross, uh, and international law academics from, from numerous institutions. Um, the workshop was held under the Chatham House Non-Attribution Policy, so today we'll be talking about some of the, the, uh, the discussion points, but we're not going to be assigning them to any particular individual. Uh, and I should remind everyone today that our participants are speaking in their personal capacity, so anything they say should not be attributed to their organization. Uh, today's moderator is Captain Tom Leary. Captain Leary is the Staff Judge Advocate for U.S. Central Command. Uh, he's had a 23-year career uh, as a national security law practitioner, serving at the strategic, operational, and tactical level. Uh, he has deployed 11 times to Afghanistan, Iraq, and at sea. Uh, Captain Leary, thank you for being here today. The floor is yours. Thanks, Chris, uh, and appreciate that, uh, that warm welcome. Um, I'm privileged to be joined uh, today uh, on this distinguished panel um, by two folks who in, in military parlance, we might say, um, have deployed extensively in their own rights. Um, you know, not just, not just uh, distinguished practitioners, but, but folks who have uh, been there and done that and have um, important stories uh, to share with us all. And I hope we'll, we'll benefit from some of that discussion today. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Professor Eric Jensen, um, who uh, currently uh, teaches at the Stanford Law School and uh, the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. Um, for the past uh, 35 years and visiting 40 developing countries, uh, Professor Jensen has developed a, just a, a remarkable resume uh, in support of rule of law initiatives worldwide and, and has a great deal, I think, to contribute to, to our discussion um, on Afghanistan, both retrospectively and, and, and perhaps also looking forward. Um, uh, to, to Professor Jensen's left uh, is um, Ms. Natalie Wiseman, um, who currently uh, serves at the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, um, herself uh, a McGill, a product of McGill School of Law in Canada, um, but also decades of experience uh, both in the field, including with the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross uh, and other organizations. Um, and uh, so we'll have kind of a rule of law perspective from Eric and then a humanitarian assistance perspective from Natalie uh, during our discussion today. And, and if I could, uh, to both of you, just begin with a question, uh, sort of setting the conditions uh, for the discussion. How do you assess the current state of play in Afghanistan as of today, December 8th, um, from the, first from the rule of law perspective for you, Eric, and then from the humanitarian uh, assistance and affairs perspective for you, Natalie. Um, Eric? Well, there's, uh, uh, there's a rule in the social sciences that uh, you should never make predictions. Uh, but I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to make a prediction. Uh, the, uh, the conditions today are, I don't think it can be described in any way but concerning. Um, it's hard to know what will go on in the future. Most of the judges in uh, Afghanistan actually come out of the Sharia school. Uh, so there's a chance that those judges may endure this uh, regime change that we've just, uh, just experienced. But how, how Islam is interpreted in the courts uh, is really where the rubber meets the road. And uh, there's a great debate within Islam about uh, how the Quran should be interpreted. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, it, it looks like it's going to be interpreted in, in ways that I would say are un-Islamic uh, and are more a result of customary law than Islamic law. Uh, but it's, I think, too early to tell how the, how the courts, how rule of law institutions are going to function. And Natalie, from your perspective. Um, to quote the director of operations of the 
ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, only, I think, weeks ago or days ago, he said that Afghanistan is on the precipice of a man-made catastrophe from a humanitarian point of view. Um, after decades of war, two uh, significant periods of drought, COVID-19, of course, and now an economic crisis that we're all reading about in the news, uh, over 22 million people are facing acute levels, uh, crisis or emergency levels of food insecurity. Uh, thousands of health facilities are now unable to procure medicine, supplies, or pay their health staff. Uh, 13 million children are either out of school or at risk of dropping out. Um, and in rural areas in particular that have seen, that are sort of facing drought, uh, something more than 7 million people whose livelihoods depend on agriculture and uh, livestock are suffering the effects of drought. So the combined effect of decades of conflict and what that has done to the country, plus drought, plus COVID-19, and now an economic crisis triggered by this change of, of control is really, if, if, not on, if not bringing the country to the precipice of catastrophe, perhaps already there. Well, and, and picking up on that point then, uh, let, me, let me ask, in the context of a discussion on, on law, international law, what, what can international law tell us about, uh, about how to proceed in light of uh, us finding ourselves, or the Afghans finding themselves on that precipice? Absolutely. So it turns out that international law does have quite a bit to say about helping people who are in exactly this kind of situation. Um, and there are 160, some, around 160 humanitarian organizations ranging from local NGOs, international NGOs, um, the ICRC, and movement components in the UN working hard to, to meet those needs. Um, and as I said, humanitarian law, international humanitarian law, which applies in armed conflict and human rights law, both have a lot to say about uh, ensuring that those needs are met. Um, now, given that even with the withdrawal of the United States uh, from Afghanistan, there are still armed conflicts ongoing in Afghanistan, and it's reasonable to see a link between those conflicts and needs and impediments to, to uh, humanitarian access, it's reasonable to say that IHL continues to apply to that in the country. And so this is where IHL, first of all, explicitly recognizes in any type of conflict that a, an impartial humanitarian body can offer its services to any party, state, non-state alike, without judging its status um, to bring uh, assistance or other forms of humanitarian um, sort of services to people in need, to those who are not fighting. Um, that requires the consent of the state. Um, and there's interesting debate over what happens when you don't get that consent. That doesn't seem to be the case right now, the issue right now. Um, and then, and then sort of the most interesting and useful rule for humanitarians is the one that requires all parties, once there is that state consent, all parties, state and non-state alike, have to proactively allow and facilitate human the passage of humanitarian relief for civilians in need without impediment. Um, and so this is the key rule that humanitarians need and use as they engage with different parties to conflict to ensure that they gain access. There's also another rule that requires that all parties ensure freedom of movement of humanitarians. That being said, you know, humanitarian law strikes a balance between military necessity and humanity, and this is where it also recognizes that a party may well have concerns um, relating to military necessity, relating to you know where the goods are going, what's in your consignment, and so IHL actually foresees ex quite explicitly um, that a party may impose technical arrangements, limitations to ensure that military operations don't interfere and vice versa, to ensure that the goods are what we claim they are, that they're going to where we say they should go, but again not to the point of impeding so, and, and Eric, I'll, I'll turn this question to you. The, the description uh, that Natalie provides of an international regime, uh, international legal regime that would govern um, the delivery of aid, um, you know, strikes me as something that would require some institutions within Afghanistan to provide 
sanction if uh, for failure to to abide by those uh, those important provisions, um, or at least you know some legal infrastructure to apply. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on uh, you know kind of your assessment, you know the last 20 years or so of of effort that's been put into building some of those institutions um, that 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 the uh, the, the Taliban or whatever government uh, comes together uh, in the coming uh, weeks or months um, might utilize, um, were they of a mind to, to, to sort of try to apply that international legal regime in a meaningful way for the, for the people of Afghanistan? You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting, Tom, because so much of what Natalie talks about, uh, it's, it's very important international humanitarian law. But the extent to which all of this will work on the ground is highly contingent on a political arrangement. And uh, without the, the, the consent of the regime, things become really, really difficult. Now, if the regime consents and is supportive, and it seems to, it's, uh, if you're looking at perhaps 97% of uh, uh, poverty within the next coming months, if that's the case, uh, uh, the Taliban have an existential question that they need to answer politically. And if they answer it uh, as one would rationally answer it, that yes, we indeed need this humanitarian assistance in an urgent uh, way for a, a sustained period of time, uh, I'm confident that the, the legal institutions that are in place and the, the, the sort of clearances and the like that are, are, are necessary to actually implement the humanitarian assistance that the legal institutions will fall in line. But without that political arrangement, uh, I have no confidence that there'll be an uh, even application of uh, hum international humanitarian law. No, fair enough. Um, to that point, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, some, of the, some of the challenges, um, some of the important lessons learned over you know, a couple of decades worth of, of rule of law efforts um, that, that the United States and, and our international partners um, uh, endeavored um, mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I think one central lesson that uh, we learned uh, is that you need a capable state and rule of law is highly contingent upon a capable state and that is a capable bureaucracy, a capable judiciary, capable police, you know, the whole, the whole infrastructure. And uh, without that capacity, it's extremely difficult. And we were put in a position, I think, where resources were available, but th those resources were going to weak institutions with weak human resource capacity. And as a result, there, there was seepage and, uh, and levels of corruption that we wouldn't uh, uh, like to see. Um, so I think you know, state capacity, having a capable state is central to uh, rule of law. The way we tried to build state capacity, there were a lot of worthwhile endeavors, and I'm not going to say this was all a failure. I certainly won't do that. Uh, but we relied too much on short-term training programs. Uh, and when, you're, when you've got uh, a judiciary that is poorly educated in the first place, that has been existing within an institution that it, it doesn't incentivize performance, uh, trying to change their habits uh, within the context of a short-term training program, I think is an ineffective uh, intervention. And I think we did, we did far too much of that. And that's one reason why I, I turned my focus to legal education, to make sure that there was a foundation of critical thinking uh, among uh, legal actors so that short-term training programs could become uh, uh, more effective. I also think that um, you know, I come from a perspective where there are serious technical issues in development and designing programs, but there are also serious politics that uh, are surround these programs. So understanding the, the deep political economy within uh, Afghanistan, the political actors, the, the ethnic divisions, uh, uh, divisions along all sorts of uh, lines is essential to being able to craft a program that uh, some of these divisive actors might uh, uh, sign on to. Uh, and I also think that donors also have a political economy and there's a pressure to, to push funding when maybe funding uh, shouldn't be pushed. Uh, and uh, uh, 
so I, I there well there are a number of things that I could talk about, sure. but maybe that's enough for now. Sure. Well, I'd, I'd ask a very similar question to Natalie. Eric's um, laid out a, a number of the challenges that that uh, we face from a rule of law. Uh, institution building perspective in Afghanistan. I wonder, are, are some of those challenges similar or different to the challenges that humanitarians would face uh, in, in their important work in Afghanistan previously and or going forward? I mean, I think that what you said about legal education very much applies to how we ensure in the long term that IHL is understood and followed. And so there's a constant effort by a number of organizations to disseminate uh, across ac academic institutions, of course, forces and groups, and even the public to ensure that it is understood so that when it needs to kick in, the people who matter, you know, apply it. Um, but the challenges uh, right now um, are, are very, they're very practical um, when it comes to humanitarian operations. Um, they relate to outright interference with humanitarian movements and activities, um, levy requests, sort of, you know, ta taxation or informal taxation, for example, um, interference with staff recruitment, with the involvement of women in humanitarian operations, also movement restrictions. You could well imagine road blockages, attacks that interrupt um, humanitarian movements. Um, and so military operations in themselves can impede uh, humanitarian activities and of course there's also continued violence and threats against humanitarian personnel and and assets that being said if we look at the numbers the figures since mid-august the numbers are going down these events are still happening but they are going down um, no doubt as a result of the change of the fact that there is much less fighting there is still fighting but perhaps less of it, and you know, there's been a, a shift in, in control. Um, and so that's where you know, we have to kind of keep our eye on, on control. It is often in other situations when control shifts and new parties begin to control territory that those challenges increase, first because fighting is likely to increase, but also because that's when parties will get nervous about humanitarian assistance reaching areas where they do not have control and they get nervous about where that aid is going to go and how it's going to um, sort of solidify even even sort of mindsets um, and and um, sort of fuel fuel the war. Um, so this is where international humanitarian law often needs to kick in to sort of support and underpin uh, engagement with the parties to en ensure that that passage can can happen. Um, but as I said, right now, um, the access difficulties f from a pragmatic point of view are those that I described and, and the figures are actually going down. So we, in, the, in the military domain, we often, and the political military domain and diploma, diplomatic as well, we often are, find ourselves talking about Afghanistan from the standpoint of leverage. What leverage do we have over uh, the, the Taliban and right now I think a lot of the, the dialogue is about their desire for legitimacy and their desire to, to uh, sustain their population so that they don't lose it. Are there any other important levers that the humanitarian uh, efforts on the ground um, would, would benefit from accessing? Um, how does the humanitarian tend to think about leverage in, in that context? Um, so we, we tend to depoliticize our activities knowing that there are in an armed conflict multiple sides um, and and that if we are even perceived to be somehow aligned or favoring one si with or, or favoring one side that will block access by the other side right and 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 jeopardize ex community acceptance of humanitarians who are there to bring help so we try to depoliticize it so leverage say political leverage is something we try and actually steer away from but often get caught in because states are the ones sort of also very much involved in the bigger picture and also trying to to help us they often are the ones financially supporting humanitarian operations so it's a tricky balance i think that um you know the leverage is ideally the law to the, the, the extent that parties respond to it a lot of 
public advocacy, private dialogue. Um, and then there are, of course, sort of the contrary of leverage. There are some other sort of political impediments. And I don't know if I should get into those now or later, but there are some political impediments to humanitarian activities that we're trying hard to, to alleviate as well. Sure. I could. OK. Yeah. So this is what um, brings me to, um, to, to sanctions. And this is the, you know, a big uh, point of political leverage that states are using and often use in other contexts. Uh, against the Taliban, um, but as they intersect with humanitarian operations, they do they do uh, impede them. Um, and so, if you recall, you know, pre pre August of this year, humanitarian operations entailed a lot of payments, taxes, fees, permits, airport airport fees, uh, elect, you know, electrical and utility bills, um, off also. Um, Payments direct, sort of direct payments to certain ministries like the ministries of Ref, you know ministry for refugees or foreign affairs or interior running prisons, to carry out necessary humanitarian operations. For humanitarian operations to continue, those payments need to continue. The difficulty now is that those ministries, those utility companies, airport, are all run by members of the Taliban who are on sanctions lists. And those sanctions, both at the US level and at the UN, um, prohibit payments to persons and groups who are listed. And so this is where humanitarians are stuck, because they've been making these payments for decades to ensure that these humanitarian operations can be carried out, and now are realizing that those same payments cannot go to these persons because they're listed. And so. This is where humanitarians have been advocating long before this situation because it's a common situation across other conflicts where there are sanctions in place. But in particular here, since August 15th, humanitarians have been quite vocal and loudly so about the need to carve out exceptions for payments necessary for humanitarian operations, which would entail accepting that those payments may still be made to persons who are listed or entities that are listed under sanctions, but strictly for humanitarian operations and to meet basic human needs. The US has actually already issued certain authorizations for that purpose. It issued them in September, so not too long after the shift in control. And we're trying hard to advocate for the same thing at the UN level, because of course UN sanctions acro uh, apply across, across the planet. Um, and so, um, uh, so this is, as we speak, something that's being negotiated at the Security Council and I think would allow um, a lot of, of banks that process payments for humanitarians, donors that give money to humanitarians, and of course humanitarian organizations, a lot of, um, it would alleviate a lot of the, the, well, the impediment and a lot of the worry about breaching sanctions. Um, so. Sure. Fingers if crossed. Could, if I could react. Yeah. I mean, uh, the UN rightly has to uh, do its uh, work and core functions uh, without regard or favor to any uh, political group. But it does strike me that you're right in the middle of a, a, yeah. a, 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 a central political issue that needs uh, uh, resolving. So it, it's it's interesting the the the, the non-political compared yes. to the the deeply political yes. issues that you're having to deal with. Yes, and um, and it makes humanitarians nervous to even have to ask political entities for permission, effectively, authorization to carry out their activities because they want to depoliticize it. So ideally, we would say, when you are applying sanctions, don't even consider applying them where humanitarian transactions are required. But it doesn't happen that way. We need something more explicit, and that is something we need to ask for. And um, to illustrate that tension right now um, at the Security Council, um, while a carve-out is being envisaged, nothing is sure yet, the, the flip side of that is a very probably going to be a very heavy reporting requirement by the 160 organizations to show how it's going and where those payments are going and show that it's, it's an acceptable 
balance. These are my words, but you know ex that there's an acceptable uh, balance. And you know the flip side of even being willing to consider a carve out is that it will be very likely if it passes for a rather short duration because states want to see how it's going to go because they are that nervous about payments going to listed entities. So it really is a, a tug of war in that sense. And the people caught in the middle mm -hmm. as well as the humanitarians. Yeah. Uh, Eric, if I could yeah. tur turn the, the, the leverage, the incentive uh, question to you from the rule of law perspective, um, where it's, it seems to me that there's a, there would be a similar um, question uh, associated with encouraging or incentivizing um, a, a population, um, a government, um, to, to, uh, uh, to engage in, in institution building and, and rule of law building. And, and I would ask you to look at that both retrospectively uh, as well as prospectively. And again, I know we, we hate to try to predict the future, um, but, but whether there, there are sufficient, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, shoots uh, of, en or of encouragement uh, bursting from the ground that, that could potentially continue to grow from a rule of law perspective? I'll, I'll do the retrospective and then the prospective. Uh, the retrospective, uh, I know that there is a, a, a great deal of, of disappointment about how, how, how it all ended in, uh, in uh, Af Afghanistan. And uh, I've asked myself, and I'm sure that uh, many others who have worked in Afghanistan, Americans over the last 20 years, and international actors, have asked themselves, was it, was it worth it? And the, the things that I was involved in, in building human resource capacity for, uh, you know, through legal education for a younger generation that's trying to imagine a different future for its country, was really gratifying. We had an opening, we had space, we seized that space. We hope that these uh, uh, young leaders uh, will uh, at some stage play a very helpful role in the development of the, the country. Uh, a number of uh, students from American University of Afghanistan are now out of the country, some are still in, but those out of the country, 90% of those out of the country want to return to the country if the political situation is welcoming. So I think that's some, that's some hope, retrospectively. We made, we made a lot of mistakes, and we, maybe we'll talk about some of the, them uh, later, uh, more mistakes. But um, you know, retrospectively, trying to, you, you talk about sprouts that we've left and what, what might grow. Uh, the, the next generation uh, gives me some, some hope, and uh, their performance in international moot courts and, and, and the like, uh, superb performance and especially among women. Uh, women are top-notchers uh, in uh, uh, the, the law faculty at uh, American University of Afghanistan and win the best voc uh, um, oralist prizes, the best brief prizes. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of human potential and my, my worry, uh, as, even as I say that, is uh, if you shackle half the population, uh, that is women, uh, in, in, in the country, I'm not very confident about its, its future development. Women have just far too much uh, uh, to offer. And then I look prospectively, again focused on, on women, uh, not in a, an international law sense, but, but the Taliban are looking for international recognition. And uh, I've advocated that that international recognition should be uh, conditioned upon uh, I, 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 a certain treatment of women. That, begins to meet some international standards of, uh, of treatment of women. I know that that's, uh, that's difficult. I think that uh, the gray beards in Doha, uh, who have uh, negotiated the agreement with, with uh, uh, the previous administration, uh, say, say all the right things. Uh, but I also know that the commanders in the field in Afghanistan have different views on, uh, on that issue. So I think that's a story yet to be told, but I, I really hope that the U.S. on leveraging, getting back to your question, Tom, uh, exercises its leverage to the fullest to uh, try to make conditions uh, as good as possible for, for that population. And of course, that was a great uh, accomplishment over the last 20 years, is when, when the 
uh, we came in in uh, 2002 after the Taliban fell, uh, there was very little uh, education of girls uh, going on. Uh, you know, last year, 40% of girls were enrolled in school. That's not uh, a complete success, but it's, it, it's really on its way to a success. So I really hope that, that the, uh, the Taliban come around on uh, education of women. I think it's critical uh, for the future, and that includes rule of law institutions. There's a, a general human resource, resource capacity deficit uh, across institutions, including legal institutions, but denying half of the population that participation is just really shooting the regime in the foot, if you will. Oh, fair enough. Uh, and you spoke of failures. And I, I mean, why don't we why don't we talk about that a little bit now? Kind of what? Where are some of the failures that, uh, or or the in the military, we we might not say failures so quickly. We you know areas where we can learn lessons. Um, some of the some of the things that we got right, some of the things that we got wrong mm. um, in, in our nation, uh, in, our, in our effort to build rule of law institutions in Afghanistan. And in particular, I wonder if you could comment on the 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 military's role in that and, you know, your overall assessment of whether we were helpful, um, you know, somewhat helpful, not helpful at all, uh, you know, did, did we contribute to success or did we, did, were we equal parts contributing to success and failure as a uniform force on the ground? Yeah, I mean, you know much better than I that there were, there were mixed signals and mixed military priorities over the, over the 20 years. Uh, and uh, that included military efforts to do development work. And I'm actually, not convinced that the military doesn't have a role in uh, development. I know it's, it, it's a, a little bit outside uh, the military's wheelhouse, uh, but the PRTs were doing some interesting work trying to uh, connect with, with communities, and they had sufficient security in ways that civilian groups did not have in certain parts of the country to carry out those development uh, activities. So, uh, you know, I'm I, I'm not going to sit in judgment yet. I think that uh, it's very healthy for... On behalf of DOD, I thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's very healthy. We all have to, I think, critically uh, 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 retrospect on, on, on what we've done and what worked and what didn't. On the civilian side, I think uh, there's a natural tendency to focus on resource-intensive uh, activities, building courthouses, computerization, uh, training. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, a story of a friend of mine, former ambassador to Afghanistan, who uh, uh, was out for a ribbon cutting ceremony at a, at a, at a courthouse uh, in, in a relatively rural area. And uh, a missile flew over his head as the uh, ribbon cutting was going on. You know, I'd suggest that building courthouses everywhere in the country is not uh, a, a healthy intervention. I call it the field of dreams approach to rule of law. Build a courthouse and people will come. And I think uh, we, we didn't take adequate account of informal institutions, the jirga and the like, and what they do well and what they don't do well. And I think that deserves some uh, critical examination too. We, uh, we went in and created a lot of formal institutions that cost a lot of money, and we knew that we weren't going to be there forever. Uh, and that's including legal institutions without looking at what, what jirgas, what informal institutions might uh, do well. We know that the, uh, these jirgas tend not to uh, handle issues well where there is power asymmetry, where you've got a, a powerful person in the community and a, and a weak person in the community economically, and we know that they don't work well on uh, gender issues. Uh, so try to carve that out and try to think of another institutional uh, arrangement so that you can mitigate the, the weaknesses of the formal institutions, informal institutions, but don't create formal institutions to just supplant the informality that is deeply embedded and deeply wired in Afghan society. It strikes me that, that your, your comment echoes um, something that General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, testified to um, with respect to a lot of the work that the department did in terms of building the Afghan military. And he openly questioned um, whether we tried to build it too much in our own image, um, you know, rather than 
um, looking at what worked in Afghanistan as a as a organic structure and and kind of building out from there. So, uh, so that's a that's an interesting observation and, and one that echoes, I think, for or will echo for DoD. And I think you know that cuts across uh, civil and military institutions that we 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 tried to create. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we need to do a better job next time. I would suggest, and I know that I'm an academic and I'm accused of creating research projects out of life, but, uh, you know, baseline research is really important to figure out in, in the legal domain, where are people going, uh, what insti uh, informal institutions exist, where are people going to resolve their disputes, and what's, a, what's their level of satisfaction with the dispute forum that they, they access. That's just basic baseline research that I think in many areas we failed to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, Natalie, from the humanitarian perspective, you know, I, I, th this discussion, this colloquy here, uh, reminds me of an observation that I've heard um, with respect to sort of the nature of Afghanistan as a country in the sense that you've got the, the urban, you know, Kabul, Kandahar, some of the other um, uh, uh, larger urban centers, which are very different uh, culturally and I would imagine rule of law wise as well. Um, than than the hinterlands, than 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 the rural areas uh, that are much more isolated. Um, I wonder, from the humanitarian perspective, um, is that what you're seeing now? Is, is the the needs are very different uh, in the rural areas than they are in the in the urban areas, um, and are the challenges uh, similar or different depending on where the where the need is uh, is lo located? Um, excellent question, and I don't necessarily have a full answer um, because I haven't. Um looked into that, that level of detail. What I can say is that the novelty right now that has not been seen in the past is that acute levels of food insecurity are now being seen in Kabul, whereas it was typically not seen there but in more rural areas. So it really is you know, more than half of the country's population that are now s facing uh, acute levels of hunger in cities and in rural areas. Of course, um, areas that, re that, that rely on agriculture um, and livestock um, where there is, you know, where drought has a significant effect, are, those areas are, are significantly affected. But it, I was looking at a map yesterday of, of, um, of where humanitarian activities are being carried out across the country. And with different shades of blue, you can see where there is more intense activity or less. Now, I'm not familiar enough to know what was rural and what was not, but I can say that there were only maybe th three or four white areas which suggested that there was no such activity for whatever reason. The rest was covered, so it really is a level of need that is across the country uh, in terms of need, you know, food needs, but also medicine, habitat, water and sanitation, education. It really is across, across the country. Um, Eric, for you, I, I, let me just uh, ask, you know, some commentators have argued that uh, state building is just not possible, um, be it by a military or, or, or by a, uh, a combined effort, military and, and civilian. Um, I'd ask you to respond to that, to that comment. Yeah, I, I know that that's a, a popular debate in Washington these days, that we can't do state building. And uh, at the outset, I want to distinguish between state building and nation building because those two terms are frequently conflated. Uh, uh, state building is the, the uh, creation of new institutions or the reformation of uh, existing institutions to try to make a state work. Uh, nation building is, is about developing a, um, a, a shared vision of the country. Uh, common values, uh, uh, historical memory, and, 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 and the like. That's quite different, and that's hard to do with international in interventions. I, I'm not going to be so pretentious as to say we can create that common vision for, for any given country. But I think we can, uh, if we do it right, uh, contribute positively to the creation of new institutions or the reform of existing institutions if we do our homework. Uh, and I think in many ways we, we didn't do our, our homework and we, we created a, a wide scope of state functions that are now reliant on a lot of funding to support public institutions. And uh, I don't know where that money is going to come from uh, uh, in the future. Okay, thanks. I think um, 
maybe maybe the last uh, kind of round of questions here. Natalie, let me ask you, you know, you, we, we have two somewhat disparate disciplines represented here on, on the panel, R rule of law and, and, and humanitarian assistance, but they, I think they are not unrelated. And, and what I'd ask is, um, and you can answer this retrospectively or prospectively, you know, if, if you had if you had Eric Jensen, you know, sitting on the panel with you uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, and, and we're thinking about uh, an Afghanistan uh, humanitarian assistance requirement, you know, what sorts of rule of law uh, efforts or institutions would you be looking for to, to, to make sure that the humanitarian assistance, you know, might be delivered or deliverable in a meaningful way? And then I'll flip that question around to, to give you a second to think, because um, I realize I'm just pulling it out of thin air, uh, but I'll flip it around and, and Eric, I'd offer, you know, thinking about humanitarian assistance and it as a, as a potential ongoing um, requirement in a, in, a, in a place like Afghanistan where, where there is certainly need, um, you know, what, what sorts of, of rule of law initiatives, you know, might we have focused, uh, you know, differently on or, or um, better on perhaps um, to ensure that that uh, you know need is 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 made available. Um, you know, Natalie, thoughts on that? They, they, like, and, and you can also fight the premise of my question no. that they're that they're you know. No, I think that the premise is absolutely correct, and I think that you know, in parallel to these very practical and and urgent activities, a lot. Uh, needs to be done and, and, and is done across all situations of conflict or even pre-conflict or post-conflict to ensure that sort of the system incorporates international humanitarian law, also human rights law, of course, but incorporates it. I mean, states, you know, all states are party to the G four Geneva Conventions and many are also party to the protocols. That means that it needs to be incorporated into legislation into um, into uh, manuals, into education at at all levels, even starting um, quite quite young, um, and then of course requires educating even even those maybe not in the military but with say security functions, but also judges because what IHL also requires is of course the investigation and prosecution of war crimes, so. Um, you know, we've been talking about sort of narrow humanitarian activities, but respect for IHL more generally can actually um, sort of preempt a lot of the need that we are answering. You know, if, if fewer medical facilities had been harmed, we might not be facing such an extreme situation in, you know, or disruption of health care if, you know, if... I mean, I, I don't want to be accusing, but you can imagine that respect for IHL in um, protecting food sources, livestock, uh, you know, uh, fields, medical facilities, schools, um, all that, if protected in line with IHL, prevents a lot of the need that you see otherwise. And that's where I think building it into institutions, into education, into legislation, into training, um, plays an enormous role. Thanks for that. Eric, your thoughts? Yeah, I, it, it's actually not an easy question to answer, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, there, um, there are basic functions of state, right? Uh, uh, monopolizing violence is sort of at the at, at the core of it. To to have the security, and that was the overall greatest challenge to doing good development work uh, in in Afghanistan. Raising revenue, some progress was made on that for a uh, a period of time, and then delivering public goods, just really stripping down the state to the, the its its functions. And on the delivery of public goods, and this is where. Uh, you know, humanitarian assistance comes into play. We did make some progress, and let's not beat ourselves up excessively. Uh, you know, uh, child and uh, maternal mortality was halved uh, during uh, this period, and uh, life expectancy uh, was increased by nine years. 
So there, there was some uh, progress on, on health and on education. It's just these things take more time. And I think I mentioned uh, yesterday that, that uh, the World Bank you know, has done a great empirical study of, of a few years ago where they, uh, they concluded that conflict-affected areas uh, probably take about 30 years to normalize. Uh, that's looking at the history of conflict. Uh, and so I think we, perhaps more than anything, if we're going to get into this, we've got to be prepared uh, politically for a longer game. And American politics isn't, you know, optimally set up for that, that longer game. Uh, but we shouldn't be surprised that a, a longer game is necessary to embed habits and, 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 and the like. And then looking more specifically at, at the role of lawyers uh, in, in development. I mean, all of these uh, public agencies had uh, legal officers. Uh, some of them performed okay, but I think focusing on the nexus between legal officers and, and bureaucratic function is, is something that is, is needed to, to consciously pursue development objectives, understanding that lawyers are a necessary part of that process. Great point. Great, great point and a plug for the, uh, for the community. Um, well, we're, we're uh, coming towards the end of our time together, so I'll, I'll offer the floor to you, uh, Eric, for, for some, any final thoughts that you might have, uh, uh, and then pass it to Natalie. Okay. okay. Um, you know, I think uh, the, uh, what we've all been wondering about was, was it worth it? And, uh, and I think some activities were worth it. I hope that we learn lessons. And uh, in my writing about this, I say lessons we may learn. Uh, I don't assume that the, the, the lessons are learned. Uh, but um, there, there were, for example, in you know, 2011 or so, 2012, there was an idea about engaging uh, informal institutions. But the, the, the design of it was, was rather incredible. It was, uh, uh, it, informal institutions could function if they had uh, state oversight. Well, local leaders are, are not going to like that, that sort of institutional arrangement. So my takeaway is that, that uh, development and, and the uh, military activity and the like really requires an interdisciplinary approach to be able to figure out what matters most and, and pursue objectives that we can actually achieve with more modest expectations than we ever had. Uh, you know, it's, it's been said that we didn't fight a 20-year war, we fought uh, 21-year wars. The, the turnover in personnel, I can't have that. You've got to have an accretion of knowledge and you've got to have a lot of local knowledge to, to do, I think, good military work and good development work in countries like Afghanistan. Thank you. Natalie, final thoughts? Um. For decades, humanitarian activities have been carried out in Afghanistan to meet very high needs. And the political shift that we've just seen should not really make a difference, practically speaking, even sort of as, as politics influence humanitarian activities, you know, it should not make a difference going forward. Um, as I said, it's very important to um, remove politics from everything humanitarian. And so there's a lot of talk about this shift and what it means. And I would like to argue that for humanitarian activities, really, it should not make a difference. I mean, we've seen needs actually rise, um, in particular because of the economic sort of crisis caused by this. Um, but I guess, yeah, the main point is Everything needs to be done to remove politics and remove the leverage, political leverage being exercised against the Taliban from humanitarian activities. And that's what IHL aims to do. It's also you know, what you derive from human rights law when it comes to meeting basic needs. Um, so I think it's important to, to look at humanitarian activities through that apolitical prism. Well, thank you. Eric Jensen from Stanford. Natalie Wiseman from the United Nations, thank you very thank much you. for this candid discussion. Uh, and thanks to the uh, Naval War College for, uh, for hosting this discussion. And uh, back to you, Chris. Thank you, sir. Well, on behalf of the Naval War College and the Stockton Center for International Law, I want to thank our panelists. Um, there aren't many institutions where I c we can get together a, uh, 
the staff judge advocate for a combatant command, uh, prof a professor from Stanford, and a, a, a member of the United Nations. Um, but I'm thankful that you took us up on the offer to have this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, we see here the d discussion on the role of attorneys um, and on how uh, international law is something that when it's applied, um, you know, the facts on the ground really matter, and I think that came out today. Um, if you'd like to learn more about what happened at the workshop, please tune in for our other panel uh, featuring Colonel Chris Ford from 1st Special Forces Command. Uh, he has a conversation with Professor Lori Blank from Emory University. In that discussion, they talk about classification of conflict, uh, rules of engagement, detainees, and uh, non-combatant uh, evacuation operations. Uh, that's it from the Naval War College. Thanks for watching.